Hello, I would like to welcome you to the CHCI Health Summit session on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the healthcare industry workforce. My name is Jose Luis Plaza and I am the National Vice President for the CHCI Alumni Association. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to thank Blue Cross Blue Shield, Bristol Myers Squibb, Davida, and Novartis for their generous support of this session. Approaches to providing equitable and accessible healthcare for all has been a central part of our national discussion for more than a decade. This session will examine challenges in finding and retaining diverse talent within the sector. We will also learn about what the healthcare industry is doing to elevate Latino and other minority groups to the industry's top echelons. Before we begin our panel discussion, it is my distinct privilege to introduce our panel host, Congresswoman Norma Torres, Javier Rodriguez, the CEO of Davida Inc., who will provide welcome remarks, and our moderator, Marvin Figueroa. Congresswoman Norma Torres is no stranger to public service. Before being elected to represent California's 35th Congressional District, she served as a state senator, assembly member, and as a mayor and council member in the city of Pomona. Throughout her career in elected office, she has worked to make government more responsive to the needs of Inland Empire residents. As a state senator, Congresswoman Torres played a significant role in making the Affordable Care Act work for California's patients and consumers. Now, on her third term in Congress, she serves on the powerful House Appropriations and Rules Committee, which is responsible for appropriating all federal spending, domestic and abroad. Next, you will hear welcome remarks from the CEO of Davida Inc., Javier Rodriguez. Mr. Rodriguez oversees healthcare services and operations in 11 countries. Davida is a Fortune 500 company with global operations that include 2,900 dialysis centers and 65,000 teammates serving over 225,000 patients. We are pleased to have as our moderator, Marvin Figueroa, who is the Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Resources for Governor Ralph Northam of Virginia. Marvin supports health and human resources state agencies to ensure they deliver quality, affordable, and accessible services to individuals with disabilities, the aging community, and low-income working families. I hope you enjoy this important and timely discussion. You can continue the conversation on social media utilizing hashtag CHCI Summit. Please welcome our first speaker, Congresswoman Norma Torres. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Congresswoman Norma Torres, and welcome to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute's Health Summit session on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what a time to be talking about DEI. How many images did you see on the news last weekend of people wearing shirts or holding signs that read, my vice president looks like me? It was generations of women and girls who've never seen themselves in our leaders before. Parents who know their daughters have more opportunities today than they did a week ago because Senator Kamala Harris became Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. People from black and brown communities that were literally targeted for the last four years are now celebrating the beauty of their diversity, our diversity. So DEI is vital, not just in politics, but in every field and particularly in the field of healthcare where lives are on the line. When we ensure a welcoming work environment, we boost employee confidence and performance. When all viewpoints are considered, we foster innovation and create a true meritocracy of ideas. And when we have healthcare workers of color, we have increased cultural competency in our doctor's offices that can help with preventive care and treatment. Pfizer just announced promising initial results for the COVID vaccine it's developing. And as we race to end this pandemic, we know healthcare workers test positive for coronavirus at a rate that's 11 times higher than the general public. That's the gut-wrenching reality for the heroes caring for our sick right now. But healthcare workers of color are nearly twice as likely to test positive than their white counterparts. And as someone with family in, healthcare, in the healthcare field, and as a Latina who represents many of these workers, that disparity is utterly unacceptable. We know we have work to do, but if there's anything we learn in this presidential election, it's that anything is possible. Thank you for joining this session today. You are a part of the solution and an agent of the change that we need. 
Together, we can achieve an America that celebrates the unique contributions that each of us brings to the table. Hello, my name is Javier Rodriguez, and I get the privilege of being the CEO of DaVita. For those of you that don't know DaVita, we take care of 200,000 patients whose kidneys don't work. We have 55,000 amazingly dedicated professionals that do that every single day. So I want to start out by thanking them and thanking CHCI and CHC for the focus on breaking down the barriers of access to care. Let me just tell you, I was not always CEO of a Fortune 500 company. I came to the United States with nothing in eighth grade, and I did not know the language, I did not know the culture. And there are people that went out of their way to make sure that I belong. And so that concept really resonates. And so we're going out of our way here at DaVita to make sure that regardless of your gender, regardless of your ethnicity, your color of your skin, that you belong and that you can thrive, that you can be a part of the community. And we're not perfect, but we are well on our way. 53% of our total population is ethnically diverse and 78% are women. And that creates a great platform for discussion and breakthrough. I continue to use the words that we could be a beacon of light. And I'm very, very proud of that. But the reality is for belonging, it takes a lot of different topics. We need to talk about economic mobility. We need to talk about health equity. We need to talk about diet. All the things that you're gonna address during your conference. And so I am super proud to be part of it. And I wanna encourage you to be active in these conversations. And I have seen the best of people in this pandemic. Our healthcare professionals have shown nothing but love and I am confident that if we focus on belonging, we will get there. Please be active, lead the way, be great listeners, great contributors. Have a great conversation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marvin Figueroa. I'm the Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Resources uh, in the office of Governor Ralph S. Northam, uh, Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. I am so delighted to be here today, and I first want to thank Congresswoman Norma Torres and Javier Rodriguez for their opening remarks and, and setting the stage um, and setting the tone for this conversation that we are going to have today. Um, and also thank you to, to CACI for hosting this critical discussion on health issues uh, facing our nation. We know that diversity, equity, and inclusion is incredibly important, especially in the healthcare sector, because it creates and, and fosters innovation and it also boosts performance. This, ses this session um, is to learn what the healthcare industry is doing to elevate Latino and other minority groups into the industry's top echelons and approaches to providing equitable, accessible healthcare for all. Uh, we want to hear from you, our audience. Uh, so please place your comments and questions in the chat. You can also uh, continue the conversation on social media through the, uh, the hashtag CACI uh, Summit. I'm delighted to be joined today by three subject matter experts on this topic. One, Dr. Naila Rolden, Chief Executive Officer, Florida International University Healthcare Network. Hello, Marvin. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And thank you. I want to thank the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute for inviting me today to discuss this very important topic, not, as, not only to our nation, but also very close to my heart as being a Latina. So thank you very much. And I look forward to, to a very uh, good conversation and dialogue today. Thank you. Wonderful. Welcome. Next is Leopardo Hidalgo, General Manager of Puerto Rico, BMS. Thank you, Marvin, and thank you very much to CHCI. It's quite an honor to be here and discussing a topic that is also so close to my heart. Welcome. And last but not least is Mr. Marion Brooks, Vice President and U.S. Country Head, Diversity and Inclusion, Novartis Pharmaceuticals. Thank you, Marvin. I am excited to be here today and really looking forward to a robust conversation about a critically important topic for our nation as well as for the world. Wonderful. What an, what an incredible panel. Uh, welcome on and, and let's get started with our conversation. So let, you know, let's just start with, with the basics. Uh, what do you or your organization uh, answer to the question, what is inclusion and how do you di differentiate that with with diversity. Yes. So diversity, I think, is having different people with different perspectives, different backgrounds at the table. Inclusion is creating an environment where their differences are celebrated 
versus tolerated. And everyone feels that they have an equal opportunity to grow, contribute, and to lead. That's inclusion from my perspective. And Dr. Rowland, what, what would you say is, is inclusion? I agree with uh, Marion that inclusion is actually what I would say walking the talk. It's not just putting it on a piece of paper, but actually embracing the differences of thoughts, uh, the norms, the values of, of the diverse group in a, in a particular arena, whether it's an organization, an academia, or any other discipline. So it is not just uh, accepting it, it's just embracing it and being part as a, as a true doctor, the DNA and the core and the heart of the organization. Mm -hmm. And Leopardo, what would, you, what would you say? I think both Byron and Dr. Roldan are just on spot. If I was to take it a little bit further and thinking about the organizations in which we all work, inclusion is really about bringing those diverse points of view and see them from different points that make the idea bigger and synergies grow from different experiences, different approaches, and ultimately, in the case of BMS, is mimicking the customers and patients that we serve in a way in which we create, develop, and deliver medicines that serve these same communities. So this is to say diversity is having everyone at the table. Inclusion, inclusion is giving everyone the opportunity to provide their point of view, and ultimately having a result in which the end result is much better because it really sees different angles that were invisible view we're seeing from a single point of view. You know, it, it seems that, and if I can remember correctly, since I've been in public policy, this conversation about inclusion and diversity has always uh, been a part of the spaces that I've, I've been in. Why is it so challenging um, to achieve it, better diversity and better inclusion? Um, and how is your organization working towards that goal? Um, let's start with Leopoldo. Uh, thank you. Yes, I think that historically there has been a disproportionate amount of opportunities for different groups, meaning that some groups were overrepresented and some were, uh, groups were underrepresented. As we became more aware that inclusive teams do perform better than homogenic uh, teams, then we saw that even as we wanted to have more people at the table with diverse point of views, probably we, the, the system was not conducted for that. As we go forward and the turning point in which we are is that systemically, we're improving in giving equitable opportunity for diverse people to come at the table uh, so we can build those teams that are more inclusive. So I think it was a matter of not having enough awareness of how diverse teams were stronger and inclusive teams were stronger. And now that we have the awareness, building that pipeline to actually get everyone at the table. And Dr. Ordan, can you talk about the impact of mentorship programs and how they can impact healthcare workforce development and retention? Absolutely, Marvin. Thank you for that question. I. I was smiling because as Lovardo was um, expressing what it meant to him, I think that building the infrastructure is extremely important. And part of that infrastructure is developing those pipelines through sponsorship and mentorship of the, indiv of the same individuals that you want to bring and surface to come to the top. In other words, to just have a statement, but not really offer the infrastructure and the support in uh, the support environment to be able to have those individuals go up to the C-suite or to directorships, et cetera, will become very, very challenging. And we will never be able to accomplish what we want to accomplish in our country, which is basically to surface the minority groups, which is gonna be the majority in the next few years across every discipline and across every industry. And I'm gonna, and that's a great point. I'm gonna come back to the idea of supportive environments. But before that, Marion, when I think about a, a pharmaceutical company, um, can you talk about your work with clinical trials, community engagement, accessible uh, materials, and how do you think about diversity and inclusion within that space? So it's critically important, and it's been said a number of times already that diverse organizations and diverse teams deliver better benefit and higher impact than more homogeneous organizations and teams. And there are three key things. Higher revenues, they're more innovative, 
and they're more responsive to customer needs. So how do we make sure that everyone is at the table and um, that we are able to elevate our impact? So one of the things that we're doing with our clinical trials is we have a really robust program that is in place across our organization to really look at the different phases of clinical trials and ensure that there is diversity at those different phases. So when you look at the first part, when you're designing a clinical trial, so who should be there? What's the patient population that should be a part of it? And are you creating the trials that are going to, in a way that is going to be conducive and receptive to those audiences? We know when we look at people of color as, and we think about clinical trials, there are some historical things that make it more of a hurdle or a barrier for people to be uh, comfortable engaging. So how do you impact that? Another thing that we're doing when you think about recruiting people to the clinical trials that are diverse is who are the people that are actually engaging with them? Are you partnering or are we partnering with the medical um, associations and groups because they are the ones that these patients trust. And if we can partner with them, ensure that they're at the table early on, the advocacy groups, the, the uh, medical um, associations to help us design the trial, help us design the materials, help us design the program. If we partner more, I think across our industry uh, with these different organizations and with each other, we will definitely increase the uh, number of people that are diverse in our clinical trials. What we know is that different medications and different drugs are metabolized and impact different patient populations. Uh, so we want to make sure that we understand those nuances up front so we don't impact or reduce the efficacy or we, have, we are up in front of any potential adverse event that those patients may experience. So I think it's critically important, but we have to have the right people at the table during the different phases of the clinical trial. And I'll, I'd like to, to stay with you on a point that you made. Um, when you think about hiring practices um, and what needs to be in place to ensure that the workforce looks like the people that they're serving to do the three things that you talked about, um, what are the things that you are looking to, to implement and, and how do you determine whether or not you've been successful? So there's been a lot. It's a great question, Marvin. So there's been a lot of activity, uh, especially since the social justice movement hit in June. And what I'm really proud of as the head of diversity and inclusion for Novartis US is that we were in front of a lot of these things already. We saw that there were some gaps and we started to put things in place. So one of the things that we did is we created new hiring guidelines that were implemented in January that required diversity of our panels as well as our candidate slates before a manager can move forward with a hire. And by having those guidelines, it, it really helps us to be more intentional about diversity. So that we have to have uh, ethnic and racial diversity as well as gender diversity on our panels. So when you think about especially the uh, millennial generation, they are looking for people that look like them on the other side of the table when they're going through a process or they will go to a company where they do see. The other thing I'll say about this is when you uh, look at the research, it shows that if you only have one woman or one person of color in a candidate pool, statistically they have no chance of receiving an offer because of confirmation bias. Just by adding one more qualified woman or person of color to that candidate pool, it goes up by 50%, over 50% that one of them may receive an offer. So just by being intentional about the diversity that we bring to the table, we have an opportunity to give more people who are qualified and ready an opportunity to lead and to be hired for some of these higher level positions. So our hiring guidelines have been a major shift or helped to create a major shift in the diversity of our uh, associate pool. And Marvin, if I may, because I think this is a topic that is at the core of it, and if I hear what Marion is saying, what Dr. Roldan is saying, you see that there's a process around finding and hiring uh, diverse talent, as well as how we select people for positions. But if you put that in a whole system, it's also about how do we ensure that there's enough people that it's ready. So mm -hmm. when they get to the interview process, they have the same chance as someone who has had a different background. And this is to say that you have to work, as Marion just described, as, as Dr. Rondan just described, people 
to be able to select the right candidate at the table. But you also have to work with those mentorship, with those sponsorship programs to be sure that people who's presented to the interview will be ready to get the position. And even before, when you're working on STEM programs, when you're working also with many of the people who's looking at us today uh, on how do we hire those people on their first job? Uh, there's recently been a publishing by Mackenzie talking about the broken rung and how it's not just the selection process, but how you advance those people in the early stages of their careers to be able to reach the upper escalons. So, so it's, it's fascinating that there's still so much to be done and to Marion's uh, point, so much that we're starting to do. And Dr. Marvin, Rodan, what does the research tell us about that? <clears throat> Marvin, it's, it's interesting because I was going to just allude to that. Um, as Marion was um, very eloquently saying about the doctors and about the patients, I can tell you that in the academic world, we also face the same thing. Obviously, we don't hire, we admit the future physicians that are going to be in the workforce. And to us, it's extremely important that diversity, equity, and inclusion is very much part of that process. It is a holistic approach mm -hmm. that we just don't look at the GPA and we don't look at the MCATS course. These are all items that we look at in order to be accepted into medical school, but we're looking at about the entire picture, not only the applicant as an individual, but how that applicant will fit in the future world of a demographic that is evolving right in front of us. So it is extremely important to be able to embrace that diversity from the beginning. It is not just looking at one piece of the uh, puzzle, but in fact, putting that person as part of the puzzle that is, that is being missed in that particular uh, place and time. So it's very, it's very, very important for us to put in all those um, um, pointers, not just for the hiring, because we are preparing those physicians that are gonna be hired in the future. And to your point, Marion, those physicians need to have the faces of those who are going to serve. So in other words, they're gonna have to have the familiar faces of those of that demographic and population that they're gonna serve in order for that population to guess what? Be compliant. You tend to trust your same. You tend to trust the same group. So it's not only the efficacy at the level of precision medicine, which you just alluded to, as far as outlining the different, how the different um, medications um, actually take, you know, evolve or, or actually affect an individual, a specific uh, population, but rather also the compliance. In order for science to know if it, they're being efficacious, we have to first have a compliant patient. And a compliant patient needs to feel comfortable in their space. And the first trust is looking at a physician that can understand their values, can understand their norms, and can actually, and basically look like them. Well, that's brought up a lot of good points there. Um, what would you say to a hiring manager um, who agrees with you, says diversity and inclusion is very important? I just can't find diverse candidates. What would be your response? And all, all three panelists, I'm hoping to get an answer from you, but let's start with Leo Badabu. It, it, it's funny because I can see all of you and all of you smiled immediately. Like, I know what to say. And to say it's like, you're not looking well enough. You're not looking hard enough. You're looking just in the same places where you have been looking all along. And to be honest, there's a number of initiatives that we're already working at BMS in which we are making an effort, an intentional way of looking into the places where we might, might find this diverse talent. Uh, be it, and I have a couple of examples that Tim was uh, kind enough to send me working with HISPA, which is an association of students uh, that it's looking at students in STEM careers at CHPRD, the Center for Hispanic uh, Research and Development, where they have internship programs at CHCI, where you can bring that diverse talent and start grooming, as well as what we have done at the CHCI uh, virtual fair, where we saw the kind of talents you have and we're able to recruit from that talent. So this is to say, if you're saying that you can't find it because you're not looking in the right places, and here are just a few examples of places where you can find this talent. Wonderful, Dr. Rodan. 
Well, I think that you need to, if, if you're really talking about uh, diversity, inclusion, and uh, equity and inclusion, you, uh, Leobardo is absolutely right. I mean, if you're really interested, there's a lot of places to find those individuals that you can tap. It's just a matter of wanting to do it. So it's not that it's not out there, but it's the fact that it needs a little bit more digging. And if you really want to uh, embrace it, you just have to do the research and do the due diligence. Great. And Marion? So I agree with all of the comments so far. And it's actually, I'm really happy that we're having this conversation because I've heard over my career. So I've been in pretty much every commercial role at Novartis during my 20 years before coming into the DNI space. And I've heard over and over that, well, I can't find qualified diverse talent for this role or that role. And I'm th and when I hear it, I'm like, well, over the years I've heard it, I'm like, well, I can pick up my phone and call three people right now that are qualified that are diverse for those roles. So if you keep fishing in the same ponds and expecting to get different fish, that's not going to happen. So how do you become intentional and really partner with different groups, with different organizations to tap into talent? I think we have to do a better job with early talent and we have our university relations group that is helping us with that. Uh, but also, I, I always reinforce that there is qualified diverse talent for every role in, within any organization that is out there, right? So how are you partnering with these different groups, these different organizations for the ready now talent? Because I always hear about going and grooming people, which we need to do. There's a lot of ready now talent that's not getting an opportunity. So how do you do that? So one of the things that we've done at Novartis is for the first time in our history, we hired a diversity and inclusion scouting and recruiting team. And their job is to build meaningful relationships with diverse communities. So we have a pipeline of talent that we're already engaging with, that we know that knows us. When an opportunity becomes available, we just tap into the relationship, we tap into the talent. So that's something that I think is a really important commitment because Everyone doesn't know where to fish. And we can say, well, hiring manager, they're out there and they're saying, well, I got to have to get this position filled quickly. I don't know how to do it. One of the things I say with that is, do you want to get it done fast or do you want to get it done right? Because we know more diverse teams and more diverse organizations outperform the homogeneous ones on the three topics that I, uh, on the three points that I shared with you all earlier. So those are my thoughts on this, but I think it's, uh, Really, we have to dispel the thought that there's not diverse talent that's ready now for these positions. And then also, what do we do to groom t uh, the early talent to be prepared? Marian, for future? If, if I may, Marvin, um, Marian, that's, th those are great points because, again, uh, you need the expert, right? And you need that person mm -hmm. that's uh, really uh, bought in to the concept in order to assist the organizations. And I include academia at the very yeah. highest level at the AAMC, which is the American College of, the American Association of Medical Colleges. We do have an individual, very close friend of mine, who is the chief of diversity and inclusion. Uh, across the colleges, you know, we all have associate deans that are, are basically focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And those are the individuals that really served at the highest levels as the, the mentors to bring all mentors in, other mentors in to be able to bring in the mentees that will be the leaders of tomorrow. But uh, it has to be intentional and it has to be yeah. part of the heart and the soul of the organization. And, and this question, this follow-up question was answered indirectly, but I'm gonna ask it more directly. I've been in a situation similar to what you just described, Marion, where the diverse candidate is then made responsible for diversity and inclusion, right? So if you want more people that look like you, I need you to bring me resumes. How do we make it less about that individual and more about a systemic thing where it is the heart and the head of the organization? I think you mentioned it, Dr. Oldham, but what does that intentionality look like? Uh, as far as the spread, you know, um, bringing it just beyond just that individual, um, mm -hmm. I think is, you know, again, it's it goes back to what we've all been discussing, you know, tapping, you know, looking at the right places at the right time, you know, and not making it just this moment in time, but making it part of the process and, in, in, you know, including it as part of the process of your everyday operations. And that would be the only way to be able to execute effectively and, and promptly and not have to wait 
Like we've all had to wait for the June of 2020. It mm -hmm. has to be part of how we basically operate in this country. Yeah. And if I hear correctly, Marvin, sorry if I jump here, is you're talking about that grassroots movement where also folks who are seen as diverse are asked to bring a pal along, and that's going to take some time. Where I hear Dr. Cloldan talking about is the systemic portion that uh, different organizations can do. I can tell you an example, for example, Bristol Myers Squibb has inclusion of one of our six core values. And within those six core values, every single person in the organization has to express that value. And as part of our year end review, we have to talk about how we are going, how we have been inclusive. And that starts permeating not only around what I expect you to do to be part of this culture, to the many other different activities that you may have as an organization to support that particular behavior. We recently pledged a commitment of $300 millions in the span of five years to uh, work around five specific things that have to do with the acceleration of health equity and diversity and inclusion. And one of those is specifically workforce representation, where it's, of course, the grassroots, of course, while we talk about values, but also putting budget and this business-like approach to actually make a structural change to advance it. So, so that's a way in which you go grassroots behavior individually and a system that supports that. Wonderful. Marion? So we trained everyone in the organization from our talent acquisition team to our people leaders to our human resource teams around these new hiring guidelines. And now we've started to receive the reports from the first two quarters. And we have significantly increased the diversity of our panels as well as our candidates slate. So people were saying before, it's really hard to find these diverse uh, individuals for these roles. But now, because we became more intentional and we have standards and expectation, we've asked people to slow down just a bit to get it right. That intentionality has already started to reap benefits. And we've hired more diverse people that are extremely qualified, as I said before, for roles that would normally not be seen or be at the table if we hadn't been more intentional. And it does sound like you, all three of the organizations you represent have been committed to this work um, for a while now. So it's not as if you're arriving recently, but is it fair to say that the pandemic and racial turmoil and the racial con in the conversation we're having around race in this country has accelerated the discussion on equity and inclusion? And, and if so, how has that impacted your work in, in your field? Uh, Dr. Rodan, you want to get us started? Absolutely, absolutely, Marvin. I think on the societal piece of it, uh, definitely what we have seen lately happen in this country has really accelerated. Um, should it accelerated, you know, as I said, we shouldn't wait for June 2020 to do what we are talking or doing right now. However, uh, that's, that's how human nature is. And un most unfortunately, still in 2020, we are talking about the disparities. When it comes to COVID-19, the huge impact in populations, in the health, economies, societal, I mean, it cuts across every single social determinants of health. And therefore, even in COVID-19, it has impacted and, and, and given it in, right in our face, the fact that we need to know and we need to take care of health disparity now. In fact, now it's too late. We need to move forward and understand that we are a nation, that we are a true melting pot, that we are a mixed demographic, and that we need to take care of all populations, not just one part of the population. I, I, I couldn't agree more, and it's unfortunate that it took the social turmoil in the US, plus a pandemic to really shed a brighter light to something that had started and started growing at a certain pace. But certainly we've seen that after these two events, the pace has increased. You can see in health disparities, COVID affects 2.8 more times Latinos that, than Caucasian white uh, ethnicities. You can see that hospitalization, it's a little bit over four times more probable for a Latino than for a white. And that's really what brings you a very vivid and tangible way to see what health disparities are. And I have seen 
many responses, not just from BMS, from, from Novartis, uh, from uh, Dr. Eneida Roldan. Now talking about companies and systems in general, looking at ways not just to address COVID-19, but use this juncture as an opportunity to, to advance everything around health disparities, clinical trial diversity, employee giving, supplier diversity, workforce representation, to really put that inflection point that we need in the curve of adoption of inclusion. So for me, I, I think it's also really important to look at how it's giving us an opportunity to create a space to have uncomfortable conversations. So creating a comfortable space to have uncomfortable conversations. I know at Novartis, we've had conversations that we were never having before that were usually looked at as that's not the type of thing that you need to talk about at work, but it actually is an opportunity now for us to have those tough conversations, for people to share their experience as leaders uh, and what they go through when they leave work uh, if they're diverse people. So we've had a lot of those conversations. And so this spotlight has given us that opportunity. And now everyone, I think, is more energized. They're more knowledgeable, right? Right? Because they're asking questions. They're open to listening. And they're like, wow, I didn't really know that it was that bad. Some of the numbers that were just uh, laid out there by 2.8 times more likely to be hospitalized or die for a person of color with COVID versus the general population. And then you start to ask the questions, well, why? And it's you go to the pre-existing conditions. And then you say, well, why are there more pre-existing conditions? And you start to unravel all those things and you say, bingo, this is where we can have impact. This is where we can start to make some changes. So by having this unfortunate situation, uh, COVID, the social justice movement happen, it's given us an opportunity to have the conversations that we weren't having, that we needed to have. Now we're having them and now we can move forward and start to plan and everyone's energized around doing something. That's the great thing that I'm uh, I'm seeing across the country is everyone's energized around doing something and I'm trying to understand what they can do, what part can they play in the different uh, levels of influence that they have. Sometimes it takes crisis. Sometimes it takes crisis to bring opportunities, but opportunities that were open to us for many many years, but now it's here and the time is right. So that's uh, right. One of the things I like to say is that. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, Marvin. Uh, I was going to say one of the things I like to say is we have to look for the opportunity and our obstacles because that's the key to moving forward into overall success. Oh, definitely. I was I was mentioning that I call it constructive discomfort, right? Those opportunities <laughs> yes. where we are all be, are bearing our souls and really being honest with one another and vulnerable. Uh, we're going to move now to some of the questions that we received from from our audience. Uh, and this will likely go to you, Dr. Rodan, is, uh you know, what would you say are the biggest challenges in getting Latinos to consider and pursue healthcare professions? I'll start with you. Well, again, is to be able for us from the beginning to be able to bring in that workforce uh, that would understand uh, the, the the challenges that 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 particular uh, group uh, is facing. It is extremely. There is no one better that to understand others than those that have actually lived it and those that have actually are in their same shoes and, and, and position. So right now, uh, that is the reason why we are embracing to bring in a diverse, and when I'm talking about diverse, I'm talking about a truly diverse, not only gender, race, LGBT, you know, groups that will be able to be the, the physicians of the future, because definitely, you know, they are needed at the front line in order to embrace that population. Great. Marion, what are you? Uh, could you repeat the question for me, Marvin? What would you say are the biggest challenges in getting Latinos to consider and pursue healthcare profession? And in this sense, it would be the pharma, you know, being in the pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it goes to, trust right so when you think about the hispanic community and getting them to engage more with medical professionals going to see them i think we have to unravel where is the trust and how where was it broken and how do we bring it back together and who should be there to help us bring it back together are we creating materials and messaging uh that is geared towards the hispanic community 
versus saying, okay, we're going to just put a, a Latino face on the top of the messaging that we were already delivering. And now this is for the, uh, the Latino community or Latinx community. So how do we become intentional about really understanding how to connect with the community and to make sure that we rebuild the trust, but you have to understand where the trust is broken. So that's the, my perspective on how we move forward. And about what would you say? I, I, I was thinking as I was listening to an example that was given by one of my colleagues in Puerto Rico. She's now a senior vice president. She's Puerto Rican, uh, working out of our New Jersey campus. But she started in the island in a very small town. She was one of six kids. And one day she said, I want to be the first one to go to school. And their parents said, that's impossible. You are a girl, you're probably the last one out of six in a small town where we need you to work to sustain the whole family. Mm -hmm. That right there was canceling the possibility of that girl to continue to go forward and actually study. She was, she is, because I know her, very stubborn, very determined, very committed to the fact that I have this dream for me and for other people. And in a number of ways, she went over obstacles that eventually got her to be a chemist, that eventually got her to work at one of our manufacturing sites. And then for the wonderful professional that she is, she continued to grow within the organization. This is to say in this example that you have to open the possibility for this to happen. And when I listen to Marion talking about how do we portray the kind of people who works with us, either at Dr. Roldan's office, either at Marion offices, we also have to include the human touch and the human stories that open the possibility that many people won't be enduring to go over if it wasn't said, if, if, if they were not given at some point an encouragement to say, you know what, that's possible. It's going to take some work, but that's possible. I think opening that possibility is key. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well said. Another question, and I think it dovetails nicely with that last comment is, you know, what are the top five strategies to advance DEI in the healthcare industry? Um, I'll start with you, Obando. But I think we've, we've spoken about a number of things, right? Uh, yeah. we're, if we're talking about professional careers in different fields, in places where originally, originally we're, we've been very homogeneous, we've spoken about a number of things. It has to do with probably creating the pipeline and creating a pipeline early on, as early as we said, as elementary school. We have to then provide opportunities for that people who's graduating to actually start a career and start advancing at the early career. That's probably where I would say this McKenzie report on the broken wrong comes in. And then once you've started your career, mentoring, sponsoring, and having an environment that systemically detects and empowers these people to continue to grow their careers at the same rate as every other group, it's crucial. Uh, so I would say it's, it's on three times. Pipeline, initiating your career, and advancing your career. Great. And if folks agree, we could just say agree, and we can move to the next question. So, don't actually, Mar Marvin, I would add, I would add to that, and I think Roberto laid it out uh, very eloquently. But to that, I would add, get yourself a CEO that truly believes in it, because mm -hmm. this is a top bottom and a bottoms up. And once you have that, then resources will start pulling pouring in and intentionality will become truly your mission and not a vision. I, I will just add, I think that's the key thing for me is to make sure you have the commitment from leadership and actions, not just words, and that you're also demonstrating by putting the resources behind it. So I think all of the things that we're doing in our different groups and organizations is important. And I think we also have to take it to the next step around what are we doing to help shape society in general? How are we investing our dollars and our time in these different communities where we know the gaps are and how are we going to step forward and make sure that there's a, a better path and equality for all of our children to be able to reach their highest goals uh, that Leobardo just talked about. 
uh, the young lady, the example from Puerto Rico, that opportunity, letting people know that there is a opportunity for you to dream big and you're going to have a network of people that are going to help you to succeed and to reach those goals. And you know, there's a related question that I think you just answered, and, and it's about how, do, how is the healthcare industry fighting systemic racism? Hmm. I, I'll start there. Uh, I, I think it is about having the conversations. As I was saying before, the social justice movement over this summer created a new environment to have uncomfortable conversations in a comfortable environment, understanding that none of us have all of the answers but together we can find the answers and we can find solutions. And I think it also is extremely important for everyone to understand their role in the uh, diversity and inclusion arena. Uh, so I've had a number of people, especially um, uh, white males during the social justice movement this summer saying, I wanna get involved, I wanna support, I wanna help, but I don't know what to do. I don't wanna say the wrong thing. I don't wanna do the wrong thing. And I think that when you look at our history, there have been a lot of things that have happened that got us to where we are. But if we're gonna move forward, everyone needs to understand their role. Everyone needs to be committed. And there has to be grace on both sides. We have to have some grace uh, for the history uh, that has happened. And people have to uh, get more comfortable being uncomfortable because they're hearing and recognizing things that have been they've been blinded to potentially over their lives. And then on the other side, I think there's some grace that people are gonna make some missteps. People are gonna ask some questions that are probably uncomfortable to you that you think they should know the answer to, but really just understanding what is our intention? Are we trying to work together and making sure that everyone uh, feels a part of the movement, not that the movement is for just certain people? How do we all come together? Just as Marion alluded to history, I think that now, uh, as a good scientist, I would also say, we need to start grading ourselves. We need to see those real stats. We need to have those rubric and we need to have that report card because that's gonna be tangible and that's gonna be seen in the population. And talking about trust, that's the way to trust when you can touch it. So now it's the time. I have to say I love this diverse panel because I keep learning from you guys. I think we should keep it going. Uh, but, but then trying to add an additional element. I think we are very influential in our communities. Uh, we, we employ thousands of people around the world and those on itself are communities where we're making the difference by discussing what we just discussed. I also think the healthcare industry has a huge reach. And here's where reach size matter because uh, we can do it not only in our communities but we can go to the places that are outside of our companies uh i've talked a little bit about the pledge that we did but this is to say that we're doing internal to bms but also reaching out all around clinical trial diversity around health disparities and reaching out to the communities that we serve doing things around supplier diversity just to make sure that those smaller businesses also grow with us. Uh, and, and this is to say that from what I've heard Dr. Roldan say, Marion say, the couple of things that we're doing, there's, there's things that we can do inside, but also how we can multiply by going outside of our organizations. And I, I would just want to add on to that. Supplier diversity is a critical, a critical opportunity for our organizations, especially in the pharmaceutical industry, to invest more. So when we think about what's important to uh, our communities is the financial component of it. And when you have these diverse owned businesses, look at how much money you're spending with these different types of businesses, the women, the uh, LGBTQ, the minority owned businesses, that investment point is a great opportunity for the pharmaceutical companies to and do more. And the, with the Pharma Trade Association, I'm a part of that in Novartis and I know BMS is as well. We're looking at those things. And so how as a collective industry, are we doing those things uh, more intentionally investing our money in those diverse businesses? I want to keep this conversation going, uh, but we have to get to the, the, the final thoughts. Um, so I'm going to start off with uh, how you appear on my screen. So uh, Dr. Rodan, want to get us started on, on some final thoughts and, and some big takeaways? Absolutely. Well, Marvin, thank you so much again for giving us this opportunity to really bring up to light 
what, as I said, shouldn't be because of June 2020 or because of COVID-19, but because it is important for us as a human race to understand that we are all equal under one under one God. And I'm gonna say it, we are all equal. So I, it's been an honor and it's a ple and an, and an honor and a pleasure to have been here with Leopardo and with Marion. And yes, we all learn from each other. And guess what? That is the true essence of diversity. It is about learning and about sharing. But if I can say a few uh, words, I think the time is now that leaders and organizations should invest, should reinvest the resources and really go from top bottom and really embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion. Not make it part of a mission statement, but make it part of their operations, execute on them, have those metrics, really build that trust in the population that truly they truly believe what it is to have a diverse workforce, what it is to have a diversity in even academia or in pharmaceutical across all disciplines. Because we are a nation that we are going to be, we continue to be a, a big melting pot and minorities are important. Minorities will be the future and the time is now and the intention to do it is now. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much for the Latino Caucus to have us here this afternoon. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, first of all, thank you, Marvin. Thank you, CHCI, for allowing me to be discussing this with all of you. I'm very optimistic about the turning point that we may be seeing in which the world, the society, companies are starting to really understand the power of diversity and inclusion and put resources and thought and brilliant people behind these efforts. I also know that even though, unfortunately, I'm not at DC looking at you today, uh, I know in the audience, it's a lot of people who's thinking about how does that relate to me from the system into individuals. My closing would be keep pushing. I work within a, an organization where I push for these things and the organization is listening. You may or may not be in a similar organization, but keep pushing so that when we find that there's an equitable environment, you are ready to take advantage of that equitable environment because the environment is only going to take us so far. It is at the end what we as individuals do to take advantage of those opportunities. Thank you very much, Marvin, and thank you very much, Dr. Roldan, and thank you very much, Marion. Wonderful, Marion. So I echo uh, my colleagues' comments, uh, and it's been a pleasure. This has been a great panel, and I really love being a part of these conversations. As you saw me, I was writing notes as uh, both of my colleagues were speaking, because uh, I was learning as well, so I really enjoyed it. And I think when I, I think about where we are right now and how we move forward, is having these types of forms is continuing to have the conversations uh, and to elevate different types of topics that may be under the surface, even in this current social justice movement. And we, uh, I, I wrote a couple of notes that, notes that highlighted some things that I think we could do better at Novartis just by being a part of this panel. But I think we have to have the conversations right now, but we also have to make sure that we are making real commitments and that we have accountability. Right, so conversation is one thing, it's great. We've surfaced it, we've uh, opened up. Now, what are the commitments that we're gonna make? And then how do we hold ourselves accountable for doing better and doing more as individuals, as well as it, as organizations? And I think that's the key for me. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much for this for this incredible conversation. Um, you know, and, and hearing, and hearing and being a part of this, um, I think one of the things that comes to mind is that we have to anchor ourselves in optimism, um, that we can acknowledge that we have come a long way and also recognize that we have a long way to go and that we have a, a shared stake in this future. And so this is not only about a particular company or a particular organization uh, being responsible for moving us forward, but how do we collectively move forward together? Uh, because it will take us thinking through what, what does better look like and then holding our leaders accountable. So I am eternally grateful for the opportunity to moderate this conversation. I wanna 
thank our wonderful panelists for their thoughtful discussion, Dr. Naiva Rodan, Leopardo Hidalgo, Marion Brooks, and, and thank you all for, for being a part of this dialogue. Uh, please keep tweeting about the summit, uh, hashtag CACI Summit. We encourage you to attend sessions the rest of the day and tomorrow. If you know people who will be interested in the summit, please, please encourage them to register at CACI.org. Again, I'm Marvin Figueroa. Um, I'm, I'm thankful for having been your moderator today, and I'll, I'll see you soon.